sunshine practically every day in the year with a cool breeze from the Gulf in the evening. This is the perimeter over which armed guards kept a 24-hour watch. At night, the illumination from the lights along the top of this fence was visible almost to the Mexican border. I didn't realize that that most of my childhood was in uh, camp, either in uh, Topaz or in Crystal City. December 7th, my father was uh, giving a sermon at the San Jose Conco Church, and the FBI there were three of them, came to pick him up. And I don't remember, because of course I was too young, but uh, my brother, who was seven at that time, said that he was uh, horrified. He didn't know what was going on. So my father was um, incarcerated in the Department of Justice camps. He was in uh, Missoula first, and then um, Lordsburg, and then to Santa Fe, and subsequently to Crystal City in uh, March, March or April of 1942. We were all evacuated. Uh, we had to go to Tamperan. At that time, I was 10 months old. It was a very difficult time, you know, for all of us to have a living quarters in a horse stable and a mattress made out of hay. Most of my siblings, the oldest was, I believe he, he must have been nine or 10. They had to carry their own clothing or whatever it was. My mother was pregnant in November of 42. Everyone was relocated to Topaz. And my father was separated from us. We were reunited in Crystal City in um, 1944. My parents were living in, in San Francisco.
My grandfather, Iwajiro Shimizu, was an officer with the uh, Japanese Association of San Francisco. Because of that, he was arrested by the FBI uh, uh, the day after Pearl Harbor. And my grandfather was taken to uh, Missoula, and then he was transferred to Lordsburg, and then to Santa Fe. My parents were married and together when they went into Tamferan. My grandfather, he came from Santa Fe to Topaz, and just around that time I was born. So I was born in March of 1943, and then in uh, August, when I was four months old, that's when four of us, my mother, father, grandfather, and myself, went to uh, Jersey City. We went by way of uh, Minidoka, Heart Mountain, to uh, Jersey City and we were transferred to Roar before being transferred to uh, Tule Lake. I have a memory of sleeping with my grandfather on the train. Now that could have only happened when I was five months old, six months old. In December, near Christmas of 1945, he tried to commit suicide by drinking gasoline. And uh, he was taken to the hospital where they pumped his stomach, and uh, he survived. But the doctor's report said that he didn't speak or eat after that. He was distraught over the fact that his uh, son and family uh, were going to be transferred to Crystal City, and he was not. He was uh, 70, uh, didn't have a place to return to, didn't have the family support system, so he tried to end his life. When he wouldn't eat or talk, uh, they, they determined that he had uh, psychological problems and that he should be sent to a mental hospital. So in February of 1946, he was uh, transferred to the State Mental Hospital in Napa. Three months later, he died there. In March of 1946, our family went to Crystal City. I had just turned three. Uh, we, I left there when I was four and a half. The FBI came. Uh, with their guns drawn, and my dad heard about this, and it was going around the neighborhood. He fled up to the mountain with my oldest brother, and the FBI sat there, waited the whole day, then they left. And my father, my oldest brother came back, but then they came the next day and arrested my dad. And they told him that he would have three days to pack up everything to get onto the ship. Uh, they didn't even tell them where we're going 
why we're being arrested. My mom, she thought that this was going to be the end of the family. I'm the youngest of uh, actually eight children in Peru. Everyone spoke Spanish because that was a language. I was 20 months old. This trip was almost about three weeks from the ship to the train ride. And during that whole period, uh, my sister kept asking for milk for me. They couldn't communicate and they basically ignored her. All through the journey, no one bathed. <laughs> you know, there's no toothbrush. We went up the coast of South America through the Panama Canal and to New Orleans, the port there. And when we arrived there, they did take us to like a warehouse and had uh, the family strip, not just us, but all the Japanese Peruvians, and they sprayed us with uh, like a DDT. Now we're all on a train, they covered up the windows. And when we arrived at our destination, my mom she saw the Japanese faces that she thought we were in Japan. And it turned out the faces, they were bus drivers for us to be taken to the camp, to Crystal City camp. Yeah. Uh, and she was relieved though when, when we got into camp to see Japanese faces. We were probably the last group of people that was um, interned at the Crystal City camp because we were brought in in 1944, uh, March of 1944, and of course the war ended in 45. We were probably the last ones to get out as well. We were there till 1947, September, so that's three and a half years. At Crystal City, we were served papers to be deported back to Peru. The Peruvian government didn't want us. They wanted the Japanese Peruvians out. Uh, they were basically too successful. We were illegal aliens, classified as that. We're illegal even though they brought us here. They said, there's no passport, there's nothing, because, of course, we had no time to get passports and so on. This is when Reverend Fukuda, who was also in camp, stood up for us as well as other Japanese Peruvian families. And he worked in concert with Wayne Collins, the attorney, to, to get papers to stop the deportation. The church was occupied by 12 families. My father explained to them that we were taken away forcibly and that now if they could find other uh, places to live and they graciously uh, moved out so we were able to get a church back. Many of the things that were stored away were missing when we came back, but but fortunately we were, you know, able to move in right away. 
I started school before I was five. I started school before I could speak English. Since I didn't speak English, they, they decided to hang a sign on me saying, do not speak English. And, uh, you know, for a couple of days or a week, maybe, I wore that sign. Coming from Peru, being wealthy, they had a chauffeur, they had a cook, they had a babysitter. So life was good. That was what was taken away from my parents. You're penniless. You don't speak the language. You know, they speak Japanese and Spanish, but not English. Uh, luckily, they were in Japan, so they were able to get by, buy groceries, day-to-day -day things. But to find a job, there's nothing meaningful. Uh, my mom uh, did domestic work. Uh, she worked in the laundry as well. My dad found anything he could. Since my parents had nothing, they, they had really, they really had zero dollars. You put as much food on the table as you can, and you get by. Uh, my sister, my dad, and myself, we fell in bad health. We all contracted tuberculosis. And um, I ended up in the hospital. Uh, I was undernourished, and um, I, was, I was there for, I don't really know, but a few months. You know? I think growing up, the church served as a sort of a community center. I lived at the church. We had this basketball court in the backyard. And later on, we had these lights where, you could, where we could play at night. And it used to be a gathering center for so many different generations of kids. The key for us was to be in this Japanese community that was our hub. That's, there was safety there for us. Our family lived there, the shop there, everything was there. The churches were there, you know, and without that, I don't think our family would have made it. We used to go to the Concord Church uh, as, as, as kids. Uh, we didn't know anything about the Shinto religion, but we used to go to Sunday school there. Uh, there eventually, uh, my brothers and I, we all joined the uh, Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts. The Concord Church started Boy Scout Troop, and uh, I joined. Troop 58 was the only Japanese uh, Boy Scout Troop that was non-denominational, even though it was uh, organized at a church. Troop 58 accepted Tule Lake people and, and others that didn't quite fit in in the Christian or the Buddhist churches. They accepted anybody that wanted to join. It was an interesting uh, conglomeration of, of people. The Boy Scout and Cub Scout, are, this became a really large group of people. We used to have our drum and bugle corps. We used to march in four, five, six parades, I bet you, every year. And that's, I go, really go back to the Konko Church in particular, uh, that what they offered the community was incredible. As teenagers, we used to have dances there and all that. We never had to get permission, we just did things, you know? But it was almost like an open church. We'd go play basketball there and do all these things. You know, it was a, it was a community center. The three of us were obviously in, in Crystal City together, but we didn't necessarily uh, play together as such. There is a photo of um, my s oldest sister uh, as a nursery school teacher, and there's Hiroshi Fukuda, Hiroshi Mizu, and Koichi Fukuda, Hiroshi's younger brother. So there was that connection, but we did get together when we got out of camp because, of, again, the Boy Scouts, the Concord Church. That's 
when it all came together. And uh, we were friends ever since. family was stripped of our human rights, civil rights. We were never charged with a crime. We were imprisoned without due process. We don't want this to happen again. It was 77 years ago that there was wartime hysteria, discrimination, which resulted in injustice. And now, 77 years later, there's hysteria, discrimination, all that in the White House. So that's resulting in, in discrimination. We must stop that. Don't let history repeat itself. Our whole effort is to end the discrimination and the imprisonment of asylum seekers, in, especially in South Texas where we were. And our message is on our t-shirt. Stop repeating history. Stop repeating history.